Good morning, this is Pastor Jerry. Welcome to Men of the Word, uh, a ministry of Calvary Chapel Heartland. We meet every Tuesday morning at 6.30 a.m., normally Atlanta Bread Company, but because of what's going on with the pandemic, hopefully we'll be able to do that again sometime soon. But for now, uh, we're just meeting via these uh, videos, and I'm thankful for Kyle to be here to tape them for us and make us look as good as we can, and we just pray that... Uh, You'll share these with other people so that God's word can just be spread throughout our world today. Uh, just a note, uh, and I'm really excited about this, our first service at Calvary Chapel Heartland will be coming up on Sunday, May 31st uh, in our outdoor amphitheater. It's very beautiful out there. It's looking really good. Uh, <clears throat> but there'll be a time change. Instead of the regular 1030, we'll be meeting at 930 a.m. And we encourage you to bring your chairs or a blanket or whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, meeting outdoors, you'll be able to distance yourself and your family, whatever you feel comfortable with. Uh, and just relax as we worship and, and listen to Pastor Steve as he teaches the word. Uh, and we've been blessed at this time during our ministry here at Calvary Chapel Heartland. Like I said, with Kyle doing our videos all of our pastors have been able to teach, and the word has gone out and reached many more people than what normally would. But, man, we're so looking forward to getting back together. And we look forward to the day that, as men of the word, we can join together again, uh, hopefully at Atlanta Bread Company or wherever the Lord may uh, lead us. Uh, but I hope you're excited about that, too. And as a side note, while you may not feel comfortable or you may be a distance away and can't attend or you may just be shut in, uh, we're going to continue to try to provide these videos online so that you can join us as we worship. And I hope you will and share that with as many uh, of your friends as possible. And we're thankful uh, for the ministry that God has given us here in middle Georgia. So today's study, we just finished the book of Amos. And as you recall, uh, Amos was a prophet, he was a farmer, and he came to Israel and he, he was giving them God's prophecy for them, the judgment that was about to come upon them, and God's intention in judging them was to bring them back to him. But today we're going to look at something different. Have you ever been mistreated by somebody or picked on and, and you just wondered, God, when are you going to turn the tables on that person? Why do you allow them to bully other people? And you just, you know, are wondering when God's going to step in. Well, today's study looks at a situation like that. And what actually happened in the book of Obadiah, which we'll be studying, is one nation continually assaulted and continually picked on and continually had contentions with the nation of Israel. And time after time after time after time, that happened. Uh, but Genesis 12, 3 says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It's talking about Israel here. The people who bless Israel will be blessed. The people who curse Israel will be cursed. And the nation we're looking at this week, Edom is one of those nations who cursed Israel. But that last part says, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you. That's talking about Jesus Christ. And Jesus, through Jesus Christ, we all have salvation. We all have redemption. And that wouldn't have happened if it had not been for God staying true to his word time after time. You see, the Bible, my Bible, <clears throat> is God's word. And it's true from cover to cover. And if you don't believe it or if you have doubts about it, uh, as we go through the things we're going through today, <clears throat> Prophecy is just opening up to us. You see, when the scriptures were written, you think about Daniel, written a long time ago, and when Daniel wrote prophecy God gave him, he was far off from that prophecy, thousands of years. And it's sort of like approaching a mountain range. Daniel was on the plain. He could see the mountain range in the distance, but it all looked like one great big mountain. Uh, and then the prophets of the New Testament, as they got closer in the hills, they could see the mountains start to separate and see the features and characteristics of each mountain. But as we live today, we are so close to those mountains, we can see exact detail. And it's easy to see in Scripture exactly what God was talking about. 
But today, like I said, we're going to be in the book of Obadiah. And I'd like to just ask, when was the last time you heard a pastor teach on Obadiah? Well, <laughs> here at Calvary Chapel Heartland, we go through the Bible chapter by chapter and verse by verse. So we don't skip anything. We don't leave anything out. And Obadiah is certainly not one of those. It is a very short book, as I've said. It's difficult to place on a timeline or even to say exactly who this particular Obadiah was because there are not really any historical events given in great detail, nor are there any uh, personal events in Obadiah's life that allow us to pinpoint because in the Old Testament there were over 10 Obadiahs. But most would agree and suggest this time frame for this particular book was around 840 B.C., uh, mainly because of verses 10 through 14, and we'll see that Obadiah mentions the Edomites joining in the invasion of Israel. Obadiah, along with Habakkuk and Nahum, are the only books of prophecy in the Old Testament that prophesy against nations other than Israel. And in Obadiah, the nation of Edom is the one that's being judged for their continued mistreatment of Israel. You see, Edom's legacy began with Esau. You remember Esau was Jacob's brother, Jacob's older brother. And so he had the birthright of their family. But one day he came in, he was famished, and for a bowl of soup, he sold his birthright. And from that day forward, Esau was <clears throat> agitated, aggravated, frustrated, and intent on doing his brother harm, even though he made his father a vow that he would not. And Edom is a nation that began as a result of Esau. So Edom continued that hatred to Israel even to the day that we're about to read about. So it was a thousand years from the time of Esau to the time we're about to read in Obadiah and his descendants just continue this pattern. Remember, it was Edom, back when Israel was leaving Egypt, that wouldn't let Israel pass through their land. They made them go around. So Edom <clears throat> was very evil towards the, land, the people of Israel. Uh, but even so, Edom was full of wisdom. They were very smart, very intelligent, and their pride uh, was another problem that they had because they lived in these cliffs. And if you've ever seen pictures of Petra, the ancient city of Petra, you know exactly <clears throat> what I'm saying because that is where the Edomites live. The last thing that we hear from Edom was when Rome conquered Israel and Jerusalem. Actually, the Edomites tried to help defend her in that case, but that's really the last that we ever hear of the Edomites, so that this prophecy that we're about to read of has been fulfilled. So turn, if you will, in your Bibles to the book of Obadiah. And the word says, the vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord concerning Edom, we have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, let us rise up against her for battle. This messenger is an angel. Usually when you hear the word messenger, you can kind of interrelate the word angel. Verse 2 says, Behold, I will make you small among nations, and you shall be greatly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, you who say in your heart, Who will bring me down to the ground? Though you exalt yourself as high as an eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. And so we see the beginning of an explanation of what Edom's problem was. It was pride. You see, Edom had a pride in their own defense. And as I mentioned, uh, the <clears throat> if you've ever seen the pictures of Petra, you know that there's only one way in, and they're up on the cliffs. These houses are carved into the rock, and they all sit above the ground. So if anybody was to ever enter to try to overthrow them, they'd be on ground level, and all the 
military people would be above them and they would shower down upon them with arrows and spears and rocks and whatever they might have. So it was very well fortified and very safe for the people that lived there. But their pride was in their own defense. And I say that to say we must be careful to acknowledge God uh, for any wisdom or might that we, we possess. Because in America we could say, oh, well, we have the greatest military in the world. And I believe that. We have the greatest wealth in the world. <clears throat> I kind of believe that. We have some of the smartest people in the world. I'm sure of that. Uh, but when we are able to defend ourselves, when we are able to look after ourselves, it's not be just because of these great people and the great military that we have. It's because God's hand is upon us. And when his hand is removed, we are susceptible if we look at what we're going through right now with the coronavirus, we thought we were impregnable, but what happened? A virus came in, and everything that we were used to, our sports, our entertainment, our finances, our jobs, everything that we have was shut down. Within a couple of days, <laughs> it was terrible. We couldn't go anywhere, we couldn't do anything. <clears throat> Our economy was taking a tumble. Even though we had this great military, we had been assaulted. And we had been made vulnerable. So we have to be careful where our faith and trust in what that is in. Is it in ourselves or is it in God? And Edom here, their pride was wholly upon themselves and not any at all upon God. So during our nation's recovery, uh, that's another thing to remember. Another point is that we need to seek God for the answers. Because the answers might come through men. But if God doesn't ordain them, they won't come at all. So we need to look to God. We need to trust in God. And we need to depend upon him for the solutions of whatever situation we're in. So on to verse 5. Verse 5 says, if thieves had come to you, if robbers by night, <clears throat> oh, how will you be cut off? Would they not have stolen till they had enough? If grape gatherers gather had come to you, would they not have left some gleanings? So Esau here in Edom, when we look at them, <clears throat> Obadiah is telling them, look, if somebody came in to rob you, they wouldn't take everything you had. You know, they'd leave a little bit. If somebody came to harvest your grapes, they're not going to pick you dry. They're going to leave something behind. But Edom was not like that. They were selfish. They wanted it all. And when they went in, as we'll see in a minute, they wanted to clean house on Jerusalem, clean house on Israel. When they were attacked by somebody else, they wanted to gather all the spoils. This is a condemnation. Verse 6 goes on to say, Oh, how Esau shall be searched out, how his hidden treasure shall be sought after. All the men in your confederacy shall force you to the border. The men at peace with you shall deceive you and prevail against you. And those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. No one is aware of it. So just kind of like we got blindsided with the coronavirus thing, Esau and Edom they are going to be attacked by somebody that's their, their friend, their buddy, their pal. You know, these are people that they hang out with, that they do trade with, that they do business with, other nations. And when God's judgment comes upon them, these are the very same people God is going to use to bring this judgment. These are the very same people that are going to come in and just wipe the slate clean with Edom. Verse 8 says, Will I not in that day, says the Lord, even destroy the wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountains of Esau? Then your mighty men, O Teman, shall be dismayed to the end that everyone from the mountains of Esau shall be cut off by the slaughter. You see, God's judgment here is very specific. Everyone is going to be cut off. 
First, you'll see the wise men, their smart people, are going to be taken away. And as they are, then the mighty men are going to become fearful because they have no leadership. The Obadiah pronounces God's judgment. It's unlike what we studied in Amos. Remember in Amos, God's judgment was to bring them back to him. Well, here the judgment is to exact God's judgment on people who have rebelled against him or his people. Psalm 44, 21 says, Would not God find this out? For he who knows, for he knows the secrets of the heart. You see, God, he understands what we're thinking. He understands what's on our mind. We can't fool God. Now, we can fool people around us, maybe even our spouse, our families. We might have them thinking, you know, we're this super spiritual person or <clears throat> we're this super righteous person on the outside. But on the inside, that's the part that God sees. We can't fool him. God understands exactly who we are. That's how he knows when to exact the judgment that brings somebody back to him and when to exact the judgment that utterly destroys because he knows our heart, just like it says in Psalm 44, 21. Verse 10 goes on to say, For your violence against your brother Jacob, remember Esau and Jacob were brothers, and later Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Verse 10 goes on to say, Shall Shame shall cover you, and you shall be cut off forever. And that day you stood on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried captive his forces. When foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, even you were as one of them. So, so get the picture here. The Edomites are related to the Israelites. Okay, and so this foreign nation comes in to take Israel captive. And Edom stands at the gates. And these foreigners are casting lots to see who gets what of the spoils. And Edom is standing there casting lots with them, trying to get some of their stuff. That's their relatives. That's people that are descendants with them. Verse 12 goes on to say, But you should not have gazed on the day of your brother, in the day of his captivity, nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah. In the day of their destruction, nor should you have spoken proudly in the day of their distress, you should have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Indeed, you should not have gazed upon their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor lay hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. You should have not stood at the crossroads to cut off those among them who escaped, nor should you have delivered up those among them who remain to the day of distress. Have you ever, as a teenager, gotten a fight? <laughs> and and somebody, somebody <laughs> that you were friends with came up and just gave you a cheap shot while you were fighting with somebody else, you know, just so they could get a lick in? That's kind of what we see in Edom, you know. They weren't really big enough to take on Israel on their own, but here they are coming up taking these cheap shots. And God and Obadiah are reminding them what they should have done and what they should not have done. You see, they were watching intently as Israel got their due judgment. Remember, it wasn't, it was what God had promised Israel. And they rejoiced over it. They were happy. <clears throat> maybe you know people, or maybe you are a person that rejoices when you see people. Uh, have trouble or be in trouble. Uh, but Edom here was doing that very same thing, and they spoke proudly, you know, like they were the ones that were part of the reason why they were getting the judgment they were getting. Uh, but God's saying, you should have been in there fighting with them. You shouldn't have just gazed on their affliction. You shouldn't have laid hands on their st substance. That's talking about their stuff, their 
homes, their livelihoods, you know, they're carrying out their widescreen TVs maybe, uh, <clears throat> anything that they had, their cattle, all of, the, all of the things that made Israel productive and made their economy well, those are the things that Edom came in and started taking away because they cast lots for them. And then after that, they stood at the crossroads. And so the people that were trying to escape, instead of letting them escape or trying to help them get away, what they did was they stopped them and they carried them back, carried them back to the, the people who were attacking them. And they delivered them up <laughs> on a golden platter. So this is the reason Obadiah lays out clearly exactly why God's judgment, this was the last straw as far as God was concerned. This is exactly why Edom was receiving the judgment that God said where there wouldn't be any of them left. Verse 15 goes on to say, For the day of the Lord is upon all the nations is near. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head. For as you drank on my holy mountain, so shall the nations drink continually. Yes, they shall drink and swallow, and they shall be as they had never been. God's saying they're going to be gone as they had never been, never even existed. There it is. You know, God's going to utterly destroy Edom for how they treated Israel or mistreated Israel. So when you ask the question, <clears throat> how does God know when to use that judgment to turn people back to himself? And when does God know to use that judgment to utterly destroy or to, to um, vindicate other people? Uh, the quick answer is, I don't know. <laughs> God tells us in his word, like we read already in Psalm forty four twenty one, would not God find this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. God knows how we think. He knows what's on our heart and our mind. So even before we take action upon it, he knows where we're headed. Um, so let's look at a, a different judgment that's, that's in the future, that's almost here, that's coming. If we turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and begin in verse 7, it says, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. That is, this was written at the time of the New Testament. So it's been at work from that time. It's already at work. Uh, only he who now restrains will do so until he t is taken out of the way. That's speaking of the rapture. It's talking about the church age. <clears throat> so this lawlessness is going to continue through the church age until the restrainer, the Holy Spirit, is taken out of the way. And when does that happen? It happens at the rapture because the Holy Spirit lives within each of us. The Holy Spirit is the one that keeps the earth in check and keeps evil back. He's the one who moderates and, and mediates and keeps us headed in the right direction. But when the rapture occurs, all the believers are going to be gone. The Holy Spirit is going to be removed from the earth. Then what happens? If lawlessness has already worked, how bad is it going to be after that? And verse 8 says, and then the lawless one will be revealed. That's the Antichrist, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's Jesus coming at the second coming at the end of the tribulation. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish. Now, this is the point I want to make right here. God knows who is going to choose him. And at the rapture, those who choose him is going to be separated from those whose hearts are not going to choose him. He knows that. I hope you're not part of that second group. I hope you're part of the first group that is raptured out of the way because he knows your heart then. And if you're the part of the second group who is going to rebel against him and not choose him as your Lord and Savior, you're going to be left behind and you're going to be with those who perish. That's what the Bible says. Those are the Bible's words, not mine. I hope you'll make the decision today. And the verse goes on, it says, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. There you have it, those who are not saved. And for this reason, 
The reason is that God knows our hearts, just like I've already said, and he understands if we've had an opportunity or not to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord or Savior, and he also knows if we've rejected him or not. He knows if we're playing a game at church. He knows if we're playing a game in front of our friends. He can see our insides, so it doesn't matter how we act on the outside. But for those people who are left behind, listen to what God says. God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. God's going to send this strong delusion to people's minds where they will think that what's going on is just fine, that everything's okay, I'm okay. Verse 12 says that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. It's God's judgment. He knows if he knows the difference when he brings judgment on a group, if they're a group that's going to turn back to him or if they're in a group that's going to turn away from him. And he knows as, as believers if we're going to follow him. But he also knows if we're a fake believer that we're not going to follow him. So God really knows us intimately. The picture I want to make, the point I want to make is this clear. Whether you're a believer, whether you're not a believer, God knows your heart. God knows my heart. We can't fake him out. But the good news is Romans 5, 8 tells us that, <clears throat> but God demonstrates his love toward us that while we are yet or still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, God knows we're sinners. God knows that we're failures at meeting his righteousness. He knows we can't measure up. He knows that. And because of that great love he has for us, he sent Jesus Christ to pay our sin debt. We can't pay it. He did it all for us. So if you think you can get away with mistreating others, you can't. If you think you can re harbor resentment towards others and <laughs> because of that treat them badly, God's not going to approve it. But maybe you are a believer and maybe you don't think God knows you or understands you. He absolutely does. He absolutely does. And maybe you think you're too far gone for God to do anything with. You are not. God is in the miracle business. God wants to have a personal relationship with you and I before it's everlasting too late. And all it takes is a simple prayer. All you have to do is say a prayer something like this. Father God, <clears throat> forgive me for I'm a sinner. Lord, I can't pay my sin debt on my own. And I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross to pay my sin debt and to be buried and to raise again on the third day. Lord, I want Jesus to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. And I want you to change me to be more like him and I want to dedicate my life to you. Amen. That's all it takes. It's just a simple prayer and confession, but you have to mean it. Because what did we just say? God knows our heart. God knows our mind. If you've made that decision or you need, want to still, or you need somebody to pray with you, you can call our prayer line, 24-hour prayer line, totally free, 478-227-4708. There'll be one of our pastors or church leaders that would love to lead you in the <clears throat> sinner's prayer to receive Christ as your Savior or just to give you guidance and pray with you and comfort you and to even encourage you. And so let's pick up our, our study back in uh, Obadiah chapter 17. It, and it changes now from Obadiah's judgment to Israel's restoration. Verse 17 says... But on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau shall be stubble. They shall kindle them and devour them, and no survivor shall remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. So this is talking about a future time for Israel, because it's talking about them being restored. And that has not happened as of the writing of Obadiah. But look at the verse 18, what it says about the house of Esau. 
no survivor shall remain in the house of Esau. Can you imagine an entire nation being wiped off the face of the earth <clears throat> when they didn't have to be? They could have just stayed. They could have done what God had called them to do, but they rejected his calling. They rejected his trying to reach them. And because of how they mistreated Israel, because of how they were antagonistic towards Israel, just like the verse we read at the beginning, they were cursing Israel. And because they were cursing Israel, God says, look, no survivor shall remain of the house of Esau. Verse 19 goes on and says, The inhabitants of the south shall possess the mountains of Esau. So somebody else is going to end up in their land. And the inhabitants of Philistine, lowland. They shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria. Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captives of the host of the children of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath and the captives of Jerusalem who are in Shepharad shall possess the cities of the south. Then saviors or deliverers shall come to Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau, and the king shall be the kingdom shall be the Lord's. You see, Israel's Israel's gonna triumph. We can't stop that. Esau, Edom could not stop that. They couldn't stop what God had planned in Israel's life. Just like if you're a believer, God, it, nobody can stop what God has planned in your life. So we may not get to see the person that, that picks on us or the person who's a bully to us get theirs. We may not get to see that. But just know that God is faithful. And also, <clears throat> don't know where you're at right now. And I want to speak closely and plainly, but mentally and emotionally, this has been a trying time for our nation. And maybe you're at a difficult place in your life and you don't understand what God's doing. You don't understand why some people are excited about what's going on. Some people are dismayed about and all the panic and the news that's all over the place. And you don't even understand if you're supposed to wear a mask or not wear a mask. I mean, it's pretty pretty crazy right now know that God's in control you know for those of us who believe that's a comfort that gives us hope to know that tomorrow's going to bring something that God ordains and God intends uh, and if you're not a believer and you don't have that hope that God's in control let me offer that to you again we showed how simple it was to accept him and God's word has shown us how, you know, he knows what's in our heart. He knows what's in our mind. He knows that we're sinners. He loves us even so. He died for us even so. He sent his only son to die for us because he loved us. So when we get to the end, like we read in uh, the book of Thessalonians, the chapter we were just reading, in chapter 2, of Second Thessalonians, and God's starting to weigh out judgment, he's going to know who's saved because we're going to be raptured. We're going to be out of here. He's going to know who's left behind. He's going to know who to leave behind because he understands. Only God can know that. I can't know whether you're lost or saved just by looking at you, but God can. God wants to have that personal relationship with you. He wants to change your life. He wants to make you a new creation, a new person, inside and out. I hope that's your you today. I hope you'll have that relationship. If you don't, I've already given the prayer line, 478-227-4708. Call us. <clears throat> don't go through this life worried and anxious. There's always somebody to talk to, somebody to encourage you, somebody to share God's word with you, somebody to pray with you. Again, I'm looking forward to us getting back together on May 31st in the amphitheater here at Calvary Chapel Heartland. I hope you'll join us. I hope we'll see you then. If not, you can catch us on video on Facebook and on YouTube. Calvary Chapel Heartland is our Facebook page and also our YouTube channel. 
Uh, be sure to subscribe so that you can catch all the pastor's teaching. Everybody's doing such a wonderful job, and God is blessing. Thank you for that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to share your word. We thank you for the opportunity to tell somebody how to be saved. And we just pray that, <clears throat> Lord, people would watch other pastors teach, not just me, other pastors, everybody, to hear the truth that comes from your word and only from your word, that gives the comfort and the hope and the peace that only you can give. God, we're in a terrible, difficult time, and <clears throat> Lord, a lot of folks don't know who to turn to, but God, I'm thankful that I do. Thankful that you saved me, and Lord, I'm thankful for your word that I have it to guide me, to change me, and to correct me when I fail. Lord, we just praise you for what you're going to do until we all gather together again. In Jesus' name, amen.